Iceman. Uh, he's the director of hardware at Y Combinator. Uh, prior to that, he's done uh, some really cool Burning Man projects like uh, Pulse and Bloom with Sam, who's also here. Uh, if you, uh, he also built a house. He lives in a box in Oakland. Uh, <laughs> he has a shipping container home in Oakland. You can see it online. It's really cool, actually. And uh, before that, also some, uh, some hardware projects that he worked on and products. So uh, Luke's going to be talking about and that just cut out. Luke's going to be talking about hardware. Welcome, Luke, to the stage. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, is that newer version? Uh, yeah, this won't work. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's all good. Uh, is that okay? Yeah. Sweet. Hi. So I'm going to talk about hardware startups, how they get into Y Combinator and or generally can kick ass in a world that is way more used to software being done as a startup. So I'm going to kind of talk about a little earlier stage than what, than what Danielle focused on. Again, disclaimer, I'm an extremist. This is my home. I have a prejudice towards things that work rather than things that are pretty, obviously. So my advice is oriented towards, OK, you want to get something done. You don't have religion about how you do it or whether it's you know, maybe technically always legal. You just want to bring it into existence. And another caveat, I work for Y Combinator. Y Combinator has traditionally funded companies like these, all of which are software, many of which are worth lots, lots of dollars in the three comma club even. These are, these are the standard terms we offer. We give startups a small amount of money for 7% of their company. So far, we've done this with 940 companies, the market value of which is about $65 billion. Our last batch, we do two batches a year, was 107 companies. So we fund a bunch of startups. We see a lot of, traditionally a lot of software. Increasingly, like in our last batch, we have so many hardware companies, kind of all of a sudden. We weren't really expecting it. You can't even like coherently fit the slides just from the la the logos just from the last batch on a slide. So hardware has suddenly become something that startups in the last couple years has become extremely common for startups to do. But first, pause and think about do you want to do a startup? You can sell kits, you can just make something for yourself that you finance with your normal day job. You should really think about whether you want to deal with the good and the bad of entering the world of high growth technology startups. You should also pause and think if you want to do a hardware startup. This is one section, this is like 1 50th of a trade show called Canton Fair outside of Shenzhen. There's lots of large machinery and equipment you have to deal with if you're doing hardware as opposed to you know, typing and clicking a couple buttons to launch new software. But it, I would argue that you should, in fact, start a hardware startup because a startup is your lever of Archimedes. It's the best way to change the world. And the world shows all signs of continuing to be made out of this messy stuff called hardware. So all that startups do is basically these seven things. It's this, it's this simple and it's this complicated. I'm going to dig in on each of these and explain what startups in Y Combinator's last class did that were making hardware before they even entered Y Combinator. First and foremost, you have to make something, particularly if you are doing hardware. The worst category you can be in if you're trying to raise money or convince customers is what I call man with a plan, like somebody who someday maybe wants to start a startup 
and has like a PowerPoint or even nice printed out graphics or renderings even of what their product might someday look like if they ever get around to building it. When you make one of something, no matter how messy it is, you become drastically further ahead than most people ever. Like everybody says they want to do a startup. Many people say they want to make hardware. But getting, getting unit one done, no matter how messy and explosion prone, differentiates you from so many other people. A great example of this is a company in our last batch called Bodyport. They applied a you know, little quick online application and told us they were going to make what sounded kind of like too good to be true, a scale that you'd step on it barefoot and it would take your blood pressure in like three seconds, which traditionally, you know, it's a cuff on your arm, generally a giant pain in the ass, and people just don't do it, but it's an important signal for improving your fitness, for fighting you know, obesity and other diseases. And they showed us a prototype that worked like maybe 2% of the time. I don't think it worked at all during their interview. But they continued making it. They iterated on it. And by demo day, they had you know, investors literally barefoot on their now working a majority of the time prototype. So it's not, there's no perfect thing that you reveal. You create hardware that people want by showing them things that are very broken. Which brings me to, to my next point. Show your things to people. Don't develop in a vacuum. Don't just be in your garage by yourself. If you want to do that, that's fine, but you're not going to develop something that has any relevance to other people if your audience is only yourself or too few people. Tbot did a great job of this. Tbot created a robot that mixes together different types of tea and lets you adjust very precisely the temperature and quantity of each of them. So like six months before we accepted them, they, this is prototype number one, right next to their school in Canada, serving people tea on a daily basis or on an every other day basis because it was down for maintenance about half the time. But they're getting data way earlier than any traditionally trained engineer who is taught to think of everything as a bridge that has to work all of the time with a giant safety margin or everyone dies, way earlier than people academically trained would, you know, would be comfortable pushing out product. Because they were able to do that, they're getting so much more feedback so much earlier that they're able to create something, not from day one, but eventually, that is way more of a fit for people, that people are way more willing to use. And then the main thing that everyone spends most of their time doing is iterating. This isn't, this isn't linear. We like to tell hero stories about startup success and product launches where there's these, these grand reveals and everything's perfect. But as soon as you dig into the details of any of those, you'll realize that what you're seeing is you know, version 300 out of 400. Great example is Nebia. They're a $400 showerhead, which you're probably thinking that's ridiculous. That's what I thought the first time I heard it. Then I took a shower and ordered one. And what they did was throughout their development process, created a whole bunch of these. This is like one fifth of the prototypes that they went through before launching of 3.5 million dollar Kickstarter during YC, and you don't get to that magical, you know, giant million dollar plus Kickstarter by just launching one of these. Each of these, they had people showering in, and they were iterating based on what people actually told them about experiencing their product. A step that many hackers and engineers miss is putting a buy now button there, allowing people to actually give you money for the thing that you have created. It sounds silly, but this is a huge missing step. I would argue that self-driving cars, self-driving golf carts at least, are basically ready to go. And it's just overly academic engineers who have not thought of the step of putting a buy now button there yet. Transcend Lighting did a great job of this. Basically, my friend Brian built a light for his dad to grow seedlings indoors and, you know, kind of on a lark, built two of them. One of them he put a buy now button next to and sold it. And so then he made a couple more and they sold. And then he continued to basically have a buy now button and make product to meet demand. And, you know, he's selling quite a few of these now. There's no, I mean, it's technically innovative, but the huge missing step for him and for other people who had created similar things earlier than he did was to actually think to offer it for sale. And then this is, this is specific to if you are doing a high growth startup and not just creating products as a small business. If you are not growing both in depth and breadth, both in the features of your current product 
and future products that you will build, you are not a high growth startup. You're like it or not, you're being compared to every software company out there. They are doing that to remain as attractive to investors. You need to continue doing that as well. Click and Grow is an automated little, it was an herb garden. You put it on your shelf, put in some water, plug it in, and it grows like rosemary and basil. And we accepted them into the program because they had started to grow the scope of what, what they're doing to include a new product, which is like a drastically better version of what they were doing before. Way more food, way less cost per unit food, and essentially a drastically better version. And they had a nice, small to medium-sized business with their one product and just continuing to offer that. But to really be a high growth startup, you, have, you can't, there's no static. Like static is death for startups. You need to continue growing. And then if you're doing something that you're selling particularly to consumers, I don't care how technically innovative it is, unless you have a compelling brand, unless you're telling a story about your product and why it's unique very quickly, like months, not years, your product, even if it sells, you know, $20 million on Kickstarter becomes a commodity. If you don't have a brand around a B2C product, it's a commodity sooner rather than later. And frankly, like life's short. You should do something better. On the flip side, a strong brand can turn a commodity into something that people pay huge margins for. L is a condom company. We had a condom company in our last batch of high growth startups. And it performed quite well because Talia, the founder, was able to create a beautiful product and tell such a compelling story around it that literally like one of the most commoditized things you could imagine, a condom, becomes this thing that is in fact a high growth startups, very compelling product. Her advertising is so good for it that when she releases a new ad, like a 30 second ad, it's so good that Cosmo, L, and many other Target publications actually do press around her putting out a new ad. So not only do you need a brand to take you know, a high-tech product and keep it defensible as a B2C product, you can actually take something very commoditized and create a compelling startup by, doing very com by telling a very compelling story around it which is something, it's kind of counterintuitive, like you would think you just put out your amazing technology and everybody figures it out. You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way in the world of consumer-facing stuff. And then, and this is very much like, not pivot, but fail. Pivot, I think, is just a stupid word that nobody should use. We need to literally embrace failure. You should be moving so quickly and you should be working on things that are interesting enough that failure is part of the process. And it's way more common than you'd think. Luna Sleep is a smart mattress pad. It lets you heat and cool individual sides. That's, they surveyed like thousands of people, figured out that that's the most common reason why couples fight at nights. So they made something that monitors your sleep, helps you optimize it, and lets you individually control temperature. And they applied for YC, and we rejected them. This is incredibly common. A huge number of the companies that get into YC, and a huge number of the people that get funding or authors that get published, any success story you want to look at, when you start to dig into it, you see a giant pile of rejections before the acceptance. So we rejected them. They you know, continued unfazed, launched a rather substantial Indiegogo campaign. They pre-sold like $800,000 worth of these covers, applied again, and we happily accepted them, and they they were able to relax in spite of their failure throughout the program. This is them at Demo Day. They had investors coming up and literally sleeping on their product. So it's that simple at a high level, and it's that complicated. If you are doing something that is not one of these, that is any of these things, you can, you can go and find huge threads of debate about how important figuring all of these out are before you ever launch a product. These are all distractions. These are all things that people's companies die because they are spending time and money trying to figure out. Every single thing on here, you can pre-sell product, you can even get product into users' hands before you worry about any of these. If you're not focused, all of these are just an excuse for debate, an excuse for hiring more people, an excuse for wasting money, and an excuse for going out of business. Or to put it another way, you should just focus on making things that people want. So if you want to do that with YC, we have late applications open now. And if you have any questions about building hardware in general, email me. It doesn't have to be for a high growth hardware startup thing. I'm happy to talk about the things I've hacked together with varying degrees of explosions and or success. Thanks for your time.